Welcome to Watchmen on the Wall, a daily outreach of Southwest Radio Ministries and SWRC.com. God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things. Today, we go back to 2003 for a classic look at the book of Revelation with former host Noah Hutchings. We're less than a month away from our next in-person event, Friday and Saturday, May 3rd and 4th in Bel Air, Kansas. Come hear Larry Spargimino, Greg Patton, Micah Van Huss, Josh Davis, Larry Stamm, Clayton Van Huss, and Rob Linstead. One World Update will be shared, Biblical Mysteries will be revealed, and the latest update on what is happening in Israel will be presented. All this and much more will be covered at the Prophecy in the News live event, May 3rd and 4th. Register today for this free event. Seating is limited, so don't delay. Visit the events page of our website, swrc.com, or register by phone, 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. Prophecy in the News Live, May 3rd and 4th at Sunrise Christian Academy in Bel Air, Kansas. Now, time to step back into the time machine. Today, we're going back to a program that first aired in 2003. The gentlemen you will hear from today are the current ministry president, Dr. Kenneth Hill, and former ministry president and program host, Dr. Noah Hutchings. Brother Hill, it's good to have you with us on this series. Thank you, Dr. Hutchings. It's a delight to be here with you and to discuss the topics that we're going to be talking about. These are so important. As we begin chapter 4, we uh, remember that the first chapter is an introduction concerning the book, about who wrote the book, why the book is written, the setting for the book. It's in the day of the Lord. John was translated in the spirit into the day of the Lord. He was shown a series of visions concerning those things which must come to pass quickly before the Lord returns, meaning a period of seven years, as we learn within the context of the book of Revelation. But before the uh, visions concerning uh, those things that are going to occur, there are seven letters to the churches of Asia. These are churches over which Brother John was bishop. They were under his care, and he was commanded to send a copy of the Revelation to these churches, and in the last chapter we read that they are to be taught in the churches. And I think the book of Revelation is very important for today, especially as we see for the first time in history, those things that John saw are now coming to pass before our eyes. He saw them in a vision. We see them on our television set. Brother uh, Ken, would you start out and read the first verse of chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. For those listening, chapter 4 begins with the Apostle John being caught up in the Spirit passing through a door into heaven. Now, we believe that this represents the church, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who died for our sins. Whether they are living or dead at this time, they will be caught up into heaven. As we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the air, And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will be taken out of this world in a glorified, resurrected, changed body. Now, you know, Brother Ken, this event is the translation of the church from earth to heaven. As you know, there are disagreements among Christians when it's going to happen. But there shouldn't be disagreement in the fact that it is going to happen. Some believe, like we do, that will happen at the end of the church age and just before the tribulation. Some believe it will happen in the middle of the tribulation. In fact, Dr. J. A. Thais, in about 
1850 wrote his big discourse on Revelation, I think uh, six or seven hundred pages, and he was a mid-tribber. It's an excellent book, excellent study book. In fact, I referenced some of it in my study on Revelation. But then some believe that there will be a partial rapture. Only those Christians who have been keeping the walk with the Lord, not just talking the talk, that they are spiritually prepared, that they will leave, but the carnal Christians will be left behind to go through at least part of the tribulation. That's called a partial rapture. And then, as I mentioned, there's a mid-trip. But many believe that the church will go all the way through the tribulation, which we do not understand that that way. But if some want to go through the tribulation, that's all right with me. But uh, I don't think I intend to go through the tribulation if the Lord would come before I go to be with him at the cessation of this life. But we notice here in uh, Revelation 4, 1, the Greek word for door is thura, which is used 37 other places in the New Testament. And it literally means a door. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means a door, like you would open a door. And in this verse, John is referenced in the singular. But as I believe, he is representative of the entire church, the entire body of Christ. And as noted in our study uh, to the letters of the churches, Jesus warns that those professing church members who are in the church, their name may be on the roll, but they are not saved. Certainly they will not be taken out because they're not Christians. They're only professing believers. Some, Brother Ken, protest the word rapture. They say, well, it's not going to be in rapture because it isn't found in the Bible. But we know that neither is the word Bible found in the Bible. The word is from the Latin Vulgate, rapir, which means to be caught up or taken away in a state of joy. If others choose not to use this word for this great event, that's okay with me. You can call it whatever you want to. You can call it translate church, the catching away, the going home to glory or whatever. But we're going to be caught up together with others in the air to meet the Lord in the air. But, Brother Ken, in our study, we give some reasons why we believe the church will be taken out of the world just before the tribulation begins. And I'm going to ask you to look at those and share them with our listeners. I'll be glad to. I, I think there are five that you mentioned in your book, Revelation for Today. The first one is that without the slightest doubt, the tribulation period is the 70th week of Daniel. The church has no place in the 70th week of Daniel. Paul said the church was a mystery hidden from the understanding of all men in previous ages. And you can uh, look that up if you want to in Ephesians chapter 3, the first eight verses. Daniel had no knowledge of the time gap between the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the great tribulation. The second point we would make is that the apostles agreed that God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And that's quoting from Acts chapter 15, verses 14 and 16. The taking out of the Gentiles a people for Christ's name, or the church, will end before Christ returns to restore Israel for the millennium. Israel is the center of tribulation prophecy. It is unreasonable that the church will be in the world in the tribulation. And the third reason that we believe that the church will be taken out of the world before the tribulation begins is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, where Paul wrote to the church that the unsaved would not escape the tribulation. And if the unsaved are not going to escape, then someone must escape, and who's going to escape? Paul has already informed us in the preceding chapter that the church will escape. And you can find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And then the fourth reason is that the second epistle of Peter, being about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and there Peter references the letters of Paul, and within the context it seems evident he was referencing Paul's prophecy by the word of the Lord about the translation, or we could say rapture, of the church. He indicated that some disputed Paul's revelation, but Peter stressed that God delivered Noah from the flood and Lot from Sodom. Therefore, according to 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. The word for temptation in the Greek used in that portion of Scripture is perasmus, which also means trial, 
And the same word used in Revelation 3.10, where it says, I will also keep them from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It is apparent the members of Christ's church will not dwell upon the earth during the tribulation. And the fifth point that we make is that the word church is not mentioned after Revelation 3.23 until Revelation 22.16. And that's after the tribulation, after the millennium, after the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. During the tribulation, Israel is in the world, the unsaved are in the world, the nations are in the world, the Antichrist and the false prophet are in the world, but no church. It appears evident that the church has been taken out of the time of tribulation that will test all who have been left behind. And that's what we believe, and that's what we teach. Brother Ken, do you have anything to share on your studies concerning the translation of the church, taking the church out of the world. Do you have anything to share from your own studies? You mean about how that we believe this to be true? Well, the one thing that has struck me over the years in taking time to look at the rapture is number five that we just mentioned. That one has always been the one that has struck me the hardest because it just simply is an absence of the church. When we speak of that, uh, just to refresh your memory, that's where the word church is not mentioned in Revelation between chapters 323 until 2216. And basically, in my studies, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell you I'm a student of prophecy like you are. No, I know better. I like to sit at your feet and learn. But just that very fact that the church is missing always gave me an understanding that the church would be gone. Now, you know, years ago, we were part of a team writing a book, uh, I was, part of a team writing a book about uh, the various views. And there are lots of views out there of what the end times hold for us. But I believe this is the most sound and succinct view. We are in the church age, the age in which God is calling out of the Gentiles a people for his name. And that is what the word church means. Mm -hmm. It means those who are called out. In the Pauline epistles, where Paul preaches the gospel to the Gentiles, he was giving a special message to those who were without a covenant, without a temple, without a sacrifice, without feast days. They had nothing. They were saved by the unmerited favor of God mm -hmm. or grace. Now, in the Pauline epistles, grace is mentioned 150 times. But you go to the book of Revelation, grace is only mentioned two times. Once at the beginning and in the last verse of Revelation. It's not mentioned in the tribulation. We're not under grace in tribulation. We're in the kingdom law age right. again. The 70th week of Daniel. There is so much evidence that the church is not going to be in the world in the tribulation that we bring out in this study. And I, I would encourage, if you haven't ordered your book on Revelation, that you get one. It's for $25. It's going to be about like a Sears and Roebuck catalog, about the same size, page-wise. But I tried not to bore the people, Brother Ken. I tried to make it readable, understandable, simple, and even in some places, a little humorous. Well, indeed you have, and uh, I've been blessed to read some advanced copies, uh, not every chapter. I haven't gotten every chapter, but I've gotten some of the advanced chapters, and I am excited. I really am. We have been pushing you, and, and I don't like the word push, but there are some of us on your board and on your staff who have been, well, pushing is the right word, pushing you to write this thing, because... We knew that this would be a wonderful work once you had it finished. And no, you don't bore us. In fact, it's exciting as we read through it. It's an easy read, quite honestly. Now, then you go back and study it. That's a different story, but it's an easy read. It's, it's a good read, and it takes you right through the Scripture. And even in certain places, you say, hey, if you haven't read this, go back and read it now in Scripture, and then come back and finish what you're doing with me. Pretty neat stuff. It's called Revelation for Today. It is Noah Hutchings' latest book, and uh, one of his finest works, in my opinion, from what I've seen of it and how I understand it to be. Ken, we are talking about the rapture. Some people confuse the rapture, or the translation of the church, with the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, 
if the church goes all the way through the tribulation, as some believe, of course, as I noted, we don't believe that, but if others want to believe it, that's fine with us. But some believe that the rapture occurs when Jesus literally comes back to this earth. In my book, I bring out the difference between the translation of the church or the rapture and the literal second coming of Jesus always to the earth. At the translation of the church, we're told we will meet him in the air, not on the earth. But now, we know at the rapture, according to Paul, that Jesus meets Christians in the air. But now that's different from his glorious appearing, isn't it? Because when he comes back as the full second coming, or his glorious appearing as, as we've talked about in previous times, he's actually going to be seen by everybody returning with the church as well as his angels or messengers, right? Right. And they're going to come back with him. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back with him. So that means him. we have to be there, right? We have to be there in order to come back. <laughs> now, at the translation of the church or the rapture, Christians are caught up. Now, all accounts of the literal second coming, no one is caught up. They're coming with him, mm -hmm. not being caught up. And the Jews will be regathered out of all nations. Now, at the rapture, there is no mention of race. No color, no black, white, brown, green, or whatever. And no mention of Mongolians, or Chinese, or Americans, or Jews, or Indians, or whatever. But at the appearing, the Jews are gathered out of all nations. That's when he comes back, literally. Now... But that's, that goes along with what we understand to be true about the fact that we are under grace and when we're under grace and if it's the church that's being caught up there's neither Jew nor Gentile there's neither Jew nor Greek there's no differentiation within the confines of the church but in the tribulation there certainly is and that's how it all works out and the truth is right there certainly and also uh, brother Ken at the rapture Paul indicates that only Christians will see Jesus, but at the second coming, literally every eye will see him or behold him. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and also those which pierced him. At the rapture, no mention is made of Jesus coming to fight the battle of Armageddon. Well, you know, that, that's interesting because, and quite true, but that's what everybody seems to think the second coming's all about. When you start talking to people, they see the rapture as being somewhere out there, but they don't want to talk about the rapture as much as they want to talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Have you noticed that? I mean, it's sort of like the end time scenario, and everybody wants to talk about those things, but there's no mention of that with the rapture, is there? No, there is going to be a Battle of Armageddon, but it will be when he comes again. Nothing is said about the Battle of Armageddon at the rapture. The rapture occurs, and then seven years of tribulation begins. We're told that plainly in the book of Revelation. But at the literal second coming, what happens? One thousand years of peace begins. So... It can't be the same event. They're separated by a period of seven years. Now, the last reason that we give here is that the rapture, Jesus comes to save the righteous, the saved. At his appearing, he comes to destroy the armies of Antichrist, and as we read in Revelation, to destroy those who would destroy the world. There's nothing said about that at the rapture, or translation of the church. Well, at the translation of the church, and when we talk of the rapture, that's what we're talking about. The church is, is translated, not transliterated, but we are the called out ones. There, it's a, it's a joy. It's a, a great expectation of being changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to be with Christ. But it's fearful when we see the literal second coming of Christ for those who are on this earth. It's a fearful thing because he's coming to destroy those armies that would be destroying him. Brother Ken, would you briefly summarize 
what we've been talking about today concerning the rapture. Well, the tribulation is the day of wrath. The present age is the day of grace. The only four verses in the four Gospels where grace is mentioned is the reference to Jesus coming to bring God's grace to the world. Grace is referenced ten times in the book of Acts. God's grace upon all who receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But at the same time, the kingdom is still being offered to Israel. Grace is referenced 120 times to the church in the epistles. Those who are saved entirely by faith through grace. But grace is only found two times in the book of Revelation. That's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, and Revelation 22, 21. God's offer of grace is removed at the taking out of the world of the church. So if the church of the dispensation of grace is to be in the world during the tribulation, then the message of grace would still be offered, but it's not there. Even in the millennium, the kingdom law will be enforced. Sinners will be cut off without mercy. So the question is, is the entrance of John through heaven's door a symbolism of the rapture? What do you think, Noah? Well, certainly, we think so, and we think we present considerable evidence here that the rapture will occur at the beginning of the tribulation. If you'd like to learn more about the book of Revelation, may I recommend Noah Hutchings' classic book entitled Revelation for Today. Revelation for Today is an exhaustive verse-by-verse study of Revelation with a contemporary application. Order your copy of Revelation for Today by Noah Hutchings when you call 1-800-652-1144. That's 1-800-652-1144. You can also order at our website, swrc.com. Revelation for Today, 1-800-652-1144. All this month, we are encouraging you to participate in our Africa Needs Jesus radio campaign. You can provide a radio, which means you can provide hope. With an update on this month's mission outreach to Africa, here is staff evangelist Josh Davis. April is anniversary month for SWRC, and we first came on the air in April of 1933, making this our 91st year of broadcasting the good news of Jesus Christ We are so excited to join together with TWR to bring a unique way to honor the missions, endeavor, and legacy of SWRC. Since it first began, SWRC has had a focus on reaching out with the good news of Jesus. In fact, that's why SWRC started on the radio, was so that the message of Jesus Christ could go further with this brand new technology that was coming out in 1933. And here we are 91 years later, still doing similar things as we're seeking to reach those who need to hear the good news of the gospel through partnership with TWR. And I'm excited to be joined in studio with John Somerville. He's the TWR Director of Radio Partnerships. We're building up to two very special days, Thursday and Friday, April 25th and 26th. So we're calling those two days, Africa Needs Jesus. John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Africa Needs Jesus campaign? and explain that for our listeners. Well, Josh, I'm excited that SWRC is joining hands with TWR to put wind-up radios into the hands of people in Africa. Now, you're probably asking yourself, wind-up radios? I didn't know they made those. Yes, they do. And as a matter of fact, wind-up radios make the perfect kind of radio to put into the hands of people in Africa. Why? Well, electricity can be awfully hard to come by if it is even available in some parts of Africa. And batteries, well, they can be very expensive. And so a wind-up radio makes the perfect solution. A wind-up radio, only $50, can reach not only just a person, but oftentimes a family or even an entire village. John, how eager are people to receive these radios when TWR is distributing them? Well, let me tell you about a, a story. When I was in the country of Malawi, I had the privilege of distributing these radios. Now, Josh, just like you and I, we like to talk to each other, Mm -hmm. looking each other in the eye. Mm -hmm. When I would go to give them the radio, they would not look me in the eye. Mm -hmm. They would instead look at the ground. This was very humbling. Here I am. I am excited. I'm like ready to give them a radio. Like, here's your radio. But no, they wouldn't look at me. They were just so humble that they would look at the ground. They would hold one hand out to receive the radio. And with the other hand, 
they would put it on their, on their wrist. And as I would put that radio into their hand, the first thing they would do is clasp that radio to their chest. Wow. This is a precious treasure that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. You're giving them more than just a radio. You're giving them the gospel. You're giving them hope. You are giving them Jesus with every single radio that you give. This is a powerful, powerful gift. Do not take it lightly. $50 gift may seem like small amount to you, or maybe it may seem big. But remember, the person on the receiving end is receiving the Word of God. Yes. And each and every day, they turn that on. They can be thanking the Lord for God's Word going into their ears and into their heart. Friends, we're visiting with John Somerville, the TWR Director of Radio Partnerships. We encourage you to call. They've got a dedicated 1-800 number that you can call and pledge your support for this special project. 1-888-777-1875. Again, that's 888-777-1875. You can also go to the website, africaneedsjesus.com. You can see the radio on the website. You can watch videos there, and you can give safely and securely. Again, that website is africaneedsjesus.com. SWRC is so excited to be able to partner with TWR in helping to reach Africa with the good news of Jesus Christ and the discipleship content that comes through this Christian programming that people will hear this in their own language, whether they're already Christians, or as we've heard stories last week, Muslims who are hearing the good news and are being influenced with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so you never know who you're going to reach. Would you prayerfully consider how you can partner with SWRC and TWR to help Africa hear the good news of Jesus Christ? Provide hope for individuals and families in Africa. Visit Africa Needs Jesus. Com and provide a radio today, africaneedsjesus.com or call 1-888-777-1975. You can provide radios that broadcast the good news of the gospel, have a truly eternal impact on lives across Africa. Visit africaneedsjesus.com. Tomorrow, we go back inside the radio vault to learn about heaven from former host, David Weber. Be sure to tune in on your favorite radio station or by downloading our SWRC mobile app. You can also visit oneplace.com, sermonaudio.com, or simply subscribe to our daily Watchman on the Wall podcast. Watchman on the Wall is a production of Southwest Radio Ministries and is supported by faithful listeners like you. Visit swrc.com.